I'm sure most of you have heard of jhanas. And in the Buddhist circles, when we talk about samadhi, usually people think about jhanas. If you're more familiar with Abhidhamma, or teachers who base their teachings on Abhidhamic concepts, you would also probably have heard of Kanika Samadhi, Upachara Samadhi, and Appana Samadhi. All these are commentarial terms and cannot be found in the suttas. Many people are not aware that there are actually many different levels of Samadhi besides the jhanas. And although these are not explicitly stated in the suttas, many people are not aware of this particular sutta. It's called Sankhita Sutta, AN 8.63, where there are many different levels of samadhi that are mentioned by the Buddha, if you can read between the lines. Of course, the commentaries will say that the different types of samadhi that the Buddha talked about refer to the jhanas. But let's scrutinize this more carefully and let's analyze to see what could these different levels of samadhi be. This is what tonight's talk will be basically about. And I will first of all give you an overview. I will start off by giving a constructive critique of Sankhita Sutta. Then I will follow up with the tabulation of the levels of samadhi that are implied, implicit in this sutta. Then I will talk about ways of attaining samadhi besides the meditations that are mentioned in this sutta, which are basically the four Brahma Viharas and the four Siddhipatthanas, the four establishments of mindfulness. And finally, I will give a conclusion. Let's start off with a constructive critique of the Sankhita Sutta. This Sutta starts off with a bhikkhu who approached the Buddha and requested the Buddha to teach him the Dhamma in brief. I've actually given one talk in Singapore many years ago. It's in YouTube now. It's called the Dhamma in brief. And I made a very comprehensive survey of all the instances in the suttas where a particular monk would approach the Buddha and ask for the Dhamma in brief. And the Buddha would give different instructions according to the temperament and inclinations of the monk. This too was given by the Buddha to a particular monk. And it may not necessarily apply to everyone. The story starts off with this bhikkhu approaching the Buddha, asking the Buddha, requesting the Buddha to teach him the Dhamma in brief. As in many cases, the Buddha would sort of complain that there are some people, they ask me to teach the Dhamma, but when I teach it, instead of practicing, they follow me around. This monk, of course, he persisted and implored the Buddha to teach him the Dhamma in brief. So the Buddha said, well, first of all, that's what you should do. You should train yourself thus. My mind will be firm and well settled internally. And the risen, bad, unwholesome states will not obsess my mind. Thus, should you train yourself. When, because your mind is firm and well settled internally, and arisen, bad, unwholesome states do not obsess your mind, then you should train yourself thus. I will develop and cultivate the liberation of the mind by loving kindness, make it a vehicle and basis, carry it out, consolidate it, and properly undertake it. Thus, should you train yourself. When does he start to practice the first Brahma Vihara? When his mind is well settled internally and arisen bad unwholesome states do not obsess his mind. 
which implies that there can still be unwholesome states of mind arising, but they do not obsess his mind. If you read between the lines, that's when he will start to practice loving kindness. Look at what the next line says. When this concentration has been developed and cultivated by you in this way, then you should develop this concentration with thoughts and examination. That's one part. You should develop it without thought, but with examination only. You should develop it without thought and examination. You should develop it with rapture. You should develop it without rapture. You should develop it accompanied by comfort. And you should develop it accompanied by equanimity. All these different mental states are listed in a sequence. When the Buddha said, when this concentration has been developed and cultivated by you in this way, what sort of concentration is he talking about? There's already a concentration there. And that concentration is not accompanied by thought and examination yet. If it were, why would the Buddha say you should develop it accompanied by thought and examination? It wasn't. That's why now he says you should develop it accompanied by thought and examination. So at that time, his concentration was just the ability not to be obsessed by unwholesome states of mind. If this will do come. I'm sure that you can testify that in your practice, whatever practice you're doing, whether it's anapana, open mindfulness, or any other Brahma Viharas, initially the thoughts will come. But you very persistently and consistently try to come back to your meditation object, and they do not obsess you. Eventually, they will fade away, they will become less, and then they become more composed. The first level of composure is something without thought and examination yet. It is just the composure that is attained without being obsessed by unwholesome states of mind. At this point, I would like to explain the meaning of samadhi. Samadhi is often translated as concentration, but actually, it is made up of three parts of Pali words. The first part is Sang, the second is A, and the third is D. Sang means properly, A means bring, and D means place. Properly bring and place your mind where you want it to be. While you are trying to practice in the beginning of your meditation, thoughts will still come and go. But slowly, you bring your mind back to your meditation object. Eventually, the mind calms down and you can properly bring and place your mind where you want it to be. That is your meditation object. Even though the thoughts do come, they don't obsess you, you are able to still come back. That is a sort of samadhi that you can properly bring and place your mind where you want to, although it's still not very stable. That's why the Buddha says, once you've attained that first level of samadhi, which is not being obsessed by these unwholesome states of mind, then you should develop it with thought and examination. And you go on. We will examine that later in detail. I'm just giving you a critique of how to read in between the lines. Did you notice this when you read the sutta? I think most of you just read it without noticing this. Let's go on to 2 to 4. This is referring to the rest of the Brahma Viharas, which are compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. It's just repeating the same thing, the same phrase. Here he says again, when because this concentration has been developed and well developed by you in this way, then you should train yourself thus. You will repeat the whole thing, you will develop and cultivate the liberation of the mind by compassion. Looking at the way this is phrased, this has been actually compressed. It's been elided, you should say. It appears as though you can only start to develop compassion after you have developed the first Brahma Vihara, that is loving kindness, until you reach the level of equanimity. 
Then it goes on to the next one. So two to four, you don't know really what happens in between. It seems that first you've got to do metta until you get it at equanimity. Then you have to go on to do compassion until you get to equanimity. Then only you can go on to sympathetic joy until you reach equanimity. And then only after that you do equanimity. On the surface, that's what it seems to be. But I would rather suggest that it should be this. You go back right to the beginning. Like I said, whatever practice that you're doing, initially your mind will still have thoughts coming in and going. It takes time for you to settle down the mind. They could also start doing compassion from the beginning. In the same way, as they develop their composure such that the unwholesome thoughts do not obsess their mind. You do it in the same way. And then when he talks about this concentration, he's referring to that first level of concentration, or first level of samadhi for compassion. We repeat this whole thing for the other Brahma Viharas as well. The first concentration refers to the one of not being obsessed by unwholesome states. Then go on to develop it with thought and examination and so forth. We repeat the same for altruistic joy or sympathetic joy. We don't have to finish developing loving kindness first and then going on to compassion first, achieving equanimity before you start to develop altruistic joy. You can actually start right from the beginning. After you have achieved this first level of composure, then you go on to the next one, and so forth. Same for equanimity. Now we go on to five. Five here starts off with kaya nupasana, contemplation of the body. Looking at the way it is phrased in this sutta, it seems that you must develop all the four brahma first until equanimity before you can start to develop the first tadipatthana. Kayanupasana, which doesn't really make sense, right? In other suttas, the Buddha just says, go straight ahead to do the Saripatana. You don't have to do the Brahma Viharas. When you read in between the lines, I think that this should also be replaced by the opening. When your mind is firm and well settled internally, and the reason bad and wholesome states do not obsess your mind, then you should train yourself thus. Then you start to do contemplation or repeated observation of the body. When you're able to do that, you can properly bring and place your mind where you want it to be. That is to say, repeatedly observing the body as the body. Then you should do it with thought and examination and so forth. Here again, you see, it goes on to 6 to 8. It seems to suggests that this is a linear process again. You still have to finish Kaya Nupasana, contemplation of the body, until you get the equanimity before you can move on to Vedana Nupasana. It's not necessarily so. In natural practice, these are all intertwined. While you're doing one, you can also do the other when the Vedana or the feelings become obvious. Or you can even watch your mind while you're watching your body at the same time. Or rather, because the mind works so fast, you think at the same time, but you're actually moving from one object to another. So you cannot just take this sutta at face value and understand it literally from the way it is phrased. You must remember that during the Buddhist time, there were no recorders. There were no writing implements. Everything was remembered by memory. The monks had to transmit whatever they had learned by word of mouth, for about 500 years before they were put down in writing on the ola leaves, on the palm leaves. Imagine the Buddha gave a one-hour talk, for example, tonight. Can you remember verbatim, word for word, what I say? <laughs> Are you going to transmit that word for word to your disciples? It's impossible. Even the Tipitaka Dara Sayadaw will not be able to do that. <laughs> What they would usually do is they would just summarize the main points of what the Buddha had discussed. Because the Buddha is talking basically about the same thing. 
in different permutations and different combinations to different people according to their needs. They would just use the same stock phrase and then turn it here and turn it there to compose. So it's easier to remember. You have chunks of stock phrases pieced together. It's easy to remember. And that's how they are able to transmit that for over 500 years, from generation to generation. That's why the Bhikkhu Sangha is your refuge. Because without the Bhikkhu Sangha, who transmitted this for over 500 years, you will not know what the Buddha taught. You don't take refuge in the Arya Sangha. You take refuge in the Bhikkhu Sangha. Not all Bhikkhus are Aryas. They are not all enlightened. Most of these bhikkhus who focused on memorizing the suttas and transmitting from one generation to another may not, or most probably, were not enlightened. Their interest was in transmitting the suttas. Those bhikkhus who were interested in meditation would probably just get the essence of what the Buddha taught, try to put it into practice, get enlightened and enjoy themselves and not bother too much about transmitting the suttas. There was this dichotomy that is found also in the suttas. There was one particular sutta where Venerable Mahachunda said that there are some monks who are scholars and they go around deprecating the practitioners, saying that they only practice but they don't know what they are practicing. And then the practitioners will say, these scholars, they're only scholar, but they don't get the taste of the Dhamma. So, Venerable Mahachunda said, that's not a very good attitude for you. You should appreciate both. Even though they may not practice, but they can transmit the Dhamma, they can understand and elucidate it. That is something also very wonderful. Even those people who are not able to transmit the teaching, they can understand it and put it into practice and get enlightened. That is also wonderful. What more to say of those who are ambidextrous? who can do both, who are both scholars as well as practitioners. Again here, it seems that you have to do, in a sequential level, each of the anupasanas. I would suggest, instead of that, you can start off right from the beginning. You just make your mind firm and well settled internally, and make sure that arisen, bad, unwholesome states do not obsess your mind when you try to practice any of the Anubhasanas. We repeat that for each of the Anubhasanas and to Dhamma Anubhasana. So I have given you a constructive critique of Sankhita Sutta. I hope that I open up your eyes on how to read the suttas without taking it verbatim, word for word, the way it is phrased. Now, we are going on to the tabulation of the levels of samadhi. Look at the numbers that are written on the second column. The Buddha's instruction to the bhikkhu was, when a mind is firm and well settled internally, and the reason bad unwholesome states do not obsess your mind, then you should train yourself thus. I will develop and cultivate the liberation of the mind by loving kindness, and so forth. And this concentration on the liberation of the mind by loving kindness or any of the meditations that are mentioned in this sutta, when this concentration has been developed and cultivated by you in this way, then you should go on to develop the next level. What is this concentration that has been developed? It is the concentration in which the mind is firm and well settled internally and arisen bad unwholesome states do not obsess your mind. That is the mental state. And this word, firm and well settled internally, is actually a translation of the Pali words that are involved in the process of developing samatha. There are four steps involved in samatha. The first step is to make the mind firm, steady. The second is to make it well settled. The third is to unify it, and the last one is to compose it. So these are the first two steps. Make it firm and settle internally. Then you should develop this concentration with thought and examination. This concentration is in which the mind is firm and well settled internally, 
and a risen, bad, unwholesome states do not obsess your mind. Then you go on to the second one, which is with thought and examination. This is not yet the first jhana. Even though thought and examination are the qualities of the mental states that can be found in the first jhana. Because the first jhana has got other mental states as well. There is also pity, no rapture, and there is sukha or comfort. But this is not there. And this is not something which is just theoretical. I'm sure that many of you who are yogis would have experienced that state. You go to a state of composure where there's no rapture and no sukha, but there's still initial thought and examination. And your mind is not obsessed by unwholesome mental states. Although they still come and go. So it goes on, you can see that there are first level, second level, third level. What I've done is I've labeled it as pre jhanic because this is not yet the first jhana. They're on the way to the first jhana. These are separate levels of samadhi that one can attain when one is trying to practice to get to the jhanas. You should also develop it with rapture. But it comes to rapture, which concentration is he talking about? Is he talking about the concentration number four, or number three, or number two, or number one? Actually, I will start from number two, which means to say you should develop it with rapture and then with thought and examination. That's one other combination. The next combination is rapture combined with the third level. You have without thought, but with examination only, with rapture. And then the next one is without thought and examination, but with rapture. This is the combination with the earlier levels of samadhi that one had attained. You can combine it with the later ones. These are all pre -janic. After that, you develop it without rapture, you take off the rapture. Then you might ask, is 6 plus 2 the same as number 2? Because number 2 is just without an examination, without rapture, isn't it? What's the difference? <laughs> What's the difference? I would say that the difference is that in number 2, we thought in examination, rapture has not arisen yet. In here, when you talk about without rapture from number 6 onwards, rapture has already occurred. And now, you are able to detach from it. You are able to see that rapture is something which is too excited. It's not something calm. It's something not peaceful. It's agitated. It's a form of agitation. Rapture. You feel thrilled. You feel excited. That is rapture. You have a very intense, joyful interest in what you're doing. When you experience that after some time, you think that this is a bit gross. I want to go to something subtler. So let's meditate without this agitation of the mind. And that's when you go on to the next one. Without rapture, now you can combine it with thought and examination. But in a new way, not in the way previously before rapture was attained. You can understand this in the same way for the other combinations. These are all pre jhanic Until you get to number seven, you should develop it accompanied by comfort. What is used here, the Pali word is sata instead of sukha. But basically, they mean the same thing. And this is the actual first jhana. You reach the first jhana only when we have all the factors of the first jhana, which are with thought and examination and rapture and accompanied by comfort. There are two other things that are not included here in order to qualify for jhana. And what is that? Quite secluded from central desires. Quite secluded from unwholesome thoughts. Initially, the unwholesome thoughts were still there. But his mind is not obsessed by them. In the first level of composure of samadhi, was still accompanied by unwholesome thoughts. But he is not obsessed by them. In the first jhana, there are no more unwholesome thoughts. And there's no thoughts also 
related to pleasures of the senses. Another thing that you should note also is that the piti and sukha that is attained at the first jhana comes about because of viveka jang piti sukhang. Viveka jang means that is born out of seclusion from unwholesome mental states and seclusion from chasing after sensual pleasures. This is also very important. The piti and sukha arise because the mind is free from unwholesome mental states and also free from the chasing of the pleasures of the senses. That's how. That's why there is rapture and there's sukha. Viveka jang piti sukha. Viveka jang means arising from or born of seclusion from chasing of the sensual pleasures and unwholesome mental states. Then we go on to second jhana. Without thought, but with examination only and with rapture accompanied by comfort. This is the jhana in the fivefold classification of jhana, where you drop vitakka and vichara step by step. In the fourfold one is when there's no more thought and examination. And then the rest becomes interjhanic because they've already gone through this rapture and comfort. And Sukha, they're now trying to go beyond that. They've seen the drawbacks, the agitation of rapture and the grossness of Sukha. Then they want to go beyond that to get to equanimity. And that becomes interjanic, although they do it step by step. They may not be able to do both at the same time. They do it step by step. But you see, there are so many different levels of Samadhi that can be attained in your practice. Not necessarily that you must get to jhana first before you can qualify as samadhi. The second jhana here is without thought and examination, but with rapture and comfort. This rapture and comfort only disappears when you go on to the third jhana. The third jhana is way below. Here we come to the fourth jhana first, because it is without thought and examination and accompanied by equanimity. The third jhana is right at the bottom, without thought and examination, but accompanied by comfort and equanimity. You develop it with rapture, you develop it without rapture, and you should develop it accompanied by comfort, you should develop it accompanied by equanimity. So I guess when you just equanimity by itself, then that would be the fourth jhana. Now I'm going to talk about my own classification. I often talked to my yogis that in the practice of open mindfulness, you can actually attain three levels of composure. The first level is when you are able to stay with the five senses, and yet there could still be thoughts coming and going. This is very much like the first one that was mentioned by the Buddha. He says that your mind is firm and settled internally. And it is not obsessed by arisen, unwholesome mental states. In the first level of composure, that is under first level. Your mind is not obsessed, but they still come and go. And then you get to level two only when there are still thoughts, but the thoughts are spaced apart. The first one, the thoughts are very near to one another, almost enmeshed with one another. You can hardly distinguish one from the other. But you are still able to maintain some sort of composure. You are still able to come back to the five senses without being pulled away by them, without rejecting them. That is the second. Mind classification is very simple. It's only whether there are thoughts or there are no thoughts. That's all. The first level is there are thoughts, but the thoughts are so near together that you cannot distinguish them. The second level is when the thoughts are spaced apart. They have become further and further apart until you get to the third level and there are no more thoughts. You can see that my classification is very broad and it covers all this. Let's go on to the next section, which is ways of attaining samadhi. In Vimutta Yatana Sutta, AN 5.26. It's called the basis of liberation. Here the Buddha says that 
There are five ways in which one can get composed. It is called a base of liberation because once you get composed, if you do not just be complacent with the composure, if you keep on practicing diligently, resolutely, then you can attain liberation. And what are these five ways? First is by listening to the Dhamma. Either the Buddha or somebody is teaching the Dhamma, you listen intently, and then at that time, your mind becomes composed. And that's when you can get liberated. That's what happened to all the non-bhikkhus, as far as I know, during the Buddha's time. All the non-renunciants during the Buddha's time, they people as well as devas, all got enlightened by listening to a Dhamma talk, not by attending any retreats. There were no retreat centers during the Buddha's time, <laughs> only monasteries. Or, more interestingly, you can even get composure when you are teaching the Dhamma. There's one particular sutta called the Kemaka Sutta, in which a Sikh monk was explaining to the elders about why, although he was Sikh, he could see the five aggregates without the view that they are mine or belonging to me or myself, he was still not an Arahant. They were very confused. They thought that only an Arahant would be able to have that sort of view. But he says, no, I can observe all these five aggregates, but I don't associate with them as mine, me, or myself. And then they wondered, how is that possible? He went there to explain to them. And as he was explaining to them, then he became an Arahant. And not only him, all the other monks as well. The others got enlightened while they were listening, but he got enlightened while he was teaching. I hope something happens to me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and then reciting the Dhamma also is something which can bring about composure. Reciting the Dhamma, as I told you, was something which was very common during the Buddha's time. The only way that you can remember the Buddha's teaching. For 500 years, they recited the Dhamma. If you recited it by yourself, you could add things or miss out things you don't know. But they have this so-called Sangiti or so-called councils. Not really councils. Uh, we call that Sangiti actually is a Pali word comprising Sang and Giti. Giti comes from Gita. Gita means song. Sangiti means singing together, choral chanting. And they were chanting in a melodious way, so that's why it's called a Gita. They will come together and chant together. When you chant together, you can't go wrong, right? If you chant out, you add things or miss out things, the others will feel it for you. That's how they maintain the purity of the tradition, by having mass recitations. I'm still trying to perpetuate that tradition. In my retreats, I ask my students to memorize Dhamma rhymes and recite them together. When they are trying very hard to remember the Dhamma rhymes, the mind doesn't run because you are so focused on trying to remember what you are reading and to recite it out of memory. When I do my mindful hiking retreats, they are not supposed to write any notes. They just listen. And then after that, they practice together. They are supposed to recite by themselves. That is also training your mindfulness. Mindfulness is about remembering, recollecting. Recitation of the Dhamma basically relies on memory, on mindfulness. Reciting the Dhamma is something which can bring about composure too. Don't belittle that. Because nowadays, our education system is such that we don't memorize things by rote anymore. We just get the main points and then we just try to answer our questions this way. But in the old days, it was different. Everything was memory work. Even when I studied Pali in the early 80s, we had to memorize all the grammatical formulas for the Pali words, the etymology, the analysis of how sang adi, uh, how it's combined together, and the ending of it, declensions, why it is declined a certain way, why certain particles are added, they are all formulas for that. Just like mathematical formula when you study 
mathematics. We have to learn all this by heart in Pali. But the Pali is not real Pali. It is made of abbreviations and acronyms. <laughs> we have to remember all that first without understanding what it means. Then, once you have memorized that, you go to class, the teacher will explain. Can you do that? <laughs> it was really very difficult for me. I don't think I can remember any now. <laughs> Just like you, can you remember any of uh, English grammar? Yeah, most of you wouldn't be able to remember the grammatical rules, but you can read and write decent English. Reciting the Dhamma can also bring about composure and also reflecting on the Dhamma. Some of you are thinkers. When you think a lot about some particular subject, at a time, time flies. You don't know, oh, it's already half an hour. I didn't know that time flew so fast. Yeah, because you were absorbed in your thinking. When you're absorbed in your thinking at that time, then also you get composure. The last one is by meditation. Properly grasping the cause of samadhi. The cause of samadhi is your meditation object. Properly grasping it, properly holding on to it, attending to it, so that the mind becomes composed. These are all various ways of attaining composure. Uh, besides the ones that we saw in Sankhita Sutta, which is basically about the four Brahma Viharas and the four Siddhibhatanas. For the first one, listening to the Dhamma, there's also additional evidence to show that the composure that one attains by listening to the Dhamma is sufficient for you to get awakened. Here, the Buddha says, when, because, a noble disciple listens to the Dhamma with eager ears, attending to it as a matter of vital concern, directing his whole mind to it, on that occasion, the five hindrances are not present in him. On that occasion, the seven factors of enlightenment go to fulfillment by development. In order for a person to attain the first jhana, one has to first of all abandon the five hindrances. The seven factors of enlightenment include samadhi. Samadhi is number six. Number seven is upeka, equanimity. That upeka or equanimity is the equanimity that comes out of wisdom, of seeing things rising and passing away due to cause and condition. That's why the mind becomes equanimous, is able to accept whatever happens without rejecting or following. When the seven factors of enlightenment go to fulfillment by development, it implies that samadhi also goes to fulfillment by development. And when is samadhi fulfilled? When the jhanas are attained, at least the first jhana. The five hindrances are abandoned, the jhana is attained, and at that time, one can become awakened. And that's what happened to all the non renunciants during the Buddha's time. The story of Yasa is a classic example. He was like a playboy. He was indulging in sensual pleasures until one day his karma was ripe. He came to his senses and then he went looking for something which is beyond tribulation. He met up with the Buddha. The Buddha gave him a Dhamma talk and he became a stream enterer at that time. So simple. No need to do any retreat. But he got jhana, I know. He got jhana. No jhana, you cannot become a stream enterer. You must have the jhana. But the jhana is not the sort of jhana that most people think it's not an absorption jhana. Jhana means something that has all the mental states of being secluded from chasing after sensual pleasures, being secluded from unwholesome mental states, and then having initial thought and also having examination. But these thoughts are not related to chasing after pleasures of the senses. These thoughts could be related to practice. How you want to compose your mind, how you want to direct your attention to whatever object that you want to pay attention to, and how you want to try to maintain it, and then constantly reminding yourself not to get lost in the object. All these things are happening in the mind. This is thought and examination. Then, of course, you must also have the rapture and happiness born out of seclusion. 
being secluded from chasing after pleasures of the senses, being secluded from unwholesome mental states. One more is Samadhi Bhavana Sutta, talking about four types of development of composure. The first is jhana. The second is perception of light. The third is awareness of feelings, thoughts, and perceptions. And finally, repeated observation of how the five aggregates arise and pass away. Now, each of this development of composure will lead to a different goal. The development of jhana will lead to the comfortable dwelling in this very life. The development of the perception of light, the samadhi that comes about through the perception of light, will lead to knowledge and vision. The awareness of feelings, thoughts and perceptions, the development of samadhi that comes about through the awareness of feelings, thoughts and perceptions, will lead to mindfulness and clear awareness. And finally, the composure, the samadhi, Arising from repeated observation of how the five aggregates arise and fall will lead to the destruction of the inflows, will lead to a rahanship. But actually, they can overlap in some ways. For instance, the perception of light, when developed, can also lead to the jhanas. When you focus on light, and then the jhana factors are there, you get to the jhanas. If all the jhana factors are still not there yet, you get to the first level of pre jhanic samadhi that I talked about earlier, or the other levels. The awareness of feelings, thoughts, and perceptions. This also happens when we are doing open mindfulness practice. In the practice of open mindfulness, we make use of the five senses to anchor our mind, to keep the mind busy so that it doesn't get caught up in thoughts about the past or the future. But at the same time, we also watch what's going on in the mind. We are aware of feelings, thoughts, and perceptions as they arise and pass away in the mind. This can also lead to the first jhana, or to the jhanas, because when the jhana factors are there, it really becomes a jhana. It's not an absorption, but as long as the jhana states are there, as long as the five hindrances are not there, then it's already a jhana. Then the repeated observation of how the five aggregates arise and fall. The same thing. When we are doing open mindfulness practice and you get to the third stage of composure, that there are no more thoughts, that's the time when you can watch the five aggregates. You watch the five aggregates in the ultimate sense. Because prior to the third level of composure, when they were still taught, you are living in the world of concepts. When you go to the five aggregates, there are no more concepts. It's just the five aggregates in their pristine, ultimate form. You must know how to watch the five aggregates. If you are able to see how the five aggregates arise and fall, the causes and conditions for them to arise and fall, to give you one particular example. For instance, we know the experience of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting. We know theoretically that the experience of seeing can only happen when there is an eye object, the eye base, and eye consciousness. When they arise together, when they are in confluence, what we call pasa. Most people translate that as contact. But I think the word sense experience is more accurate because it is the actual experience of seeing. Eye consciousness by itself cannot see. It can only see when there's an eye object and the eye base is working properly. When all three of them are working properly, are there, arise at the same time, then only the experience of seeing occurs. While you are in that third stage of composure, no more thoughts, one is still aware of the five senses. There are no more thoughts. But the mind must always have an object. So what is it aware of? The mind is conscious of the five senses. Things are coming and going. 
but he's not labeling anything, there are no concepts. But he can see that, oh, this seeing arises because of this condition, the condition that there's an eye base, and there's an object, and there is eye consciousness. You can also see, for example, that pleasure arises. Pleasure, why? Because the mind becomes composed. Composure gives rise to pleasure. And then because of pleasure, attachment arises. You want to hold on to that feeling, hold on to that state, you want to maintain it. That is, you can see also the cause and condition. You can see the causes behind all these mental states that are happening in our mind. But this understanding is a wordless understanding. It doesn't come in concepts. That is also a repeated observation of the five aggregates. And that can also qualify to be jhana if the jhana factors are there. If they cannot get to the jhanas, then they can get to the pre- or interjhanic states. Any of these. Now we go on to the conclusion. Well, the conclusion is that there are different ways of attaining samadhi besides meditation as popularly understood. We saw so many ways. The four Brahma Viharas, the four Satipatthanas, the five phases of liberation, the four types of development of samadhi. There are different levels of samadhi apart from the jhanas and the arupas, the pre jhanic state levels and the inter jhanic levels. However, only samadhi at the jhanic level can qualify as sama samadhi. Whatever samadhi it is, it must be at the jhanic level in order to qualify as sama samadhi, besides being also supported by the other factors of the noble eightfold path. I shall end my talk here. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask.